Hello, hello, welcome. Here we are. We're here to learn to let go and laugh to enlightenment. <laughs> of course, I've got some good jokes for you set up. Um, let's let go of some seriousness, release some energy, enjoy meditating, maybe do some healing, and have a few giggles. <laughs> Or at least I will. I don't know what you're up to today. So there, I'll, I'm going to share a few jokes in a moment, but there are two types of seriousness. So I want to, I just want to be clear. And I go over this in the Laughing to Enlightenment course too. There are two types of seriousness. There's the one type of seriousness that's useful, helpful. If you're a heart surgeon and you're doing open heart surgery, you need to be serious. I don't want my heart surgeon giggling over my heart. <laughs> while they're pulling out of my chest, right? Uh, if you're flying a spaceship, if whatever it is, there are moments in life to be very serious. If someone's having, uh, you know, uh, an emergency, there's a good kind of serious that's useful, that makes us focus, concentrate, accomplish something, be present, right? And then there is the not so useful kind of seriousness. And this is the one that uh, most people spend too much time in. The kind of seriousness that makes us stressed out because we keep worrying and thinking about something. The kind of seriousness that makes us stiff as a board. <laughs> when we meditate, right? When we're in life and we just want an outcome and we're not willing to let life unfold, we can get very serious and intense. And I also want to be clear that some people have more of a natural, serious tone to their energy, and other people, maybe like me, were born goofier. <laughs> so uh, if you do have a natural, serious tone, you don't need to, you know, criticize yourself for that. But it might be an opportunity to open up more. And I don't know the evolution of laughter, but my guess is it evolved from human beings trying to cope with pain, right? Human beings trying to cope with pain. It's a, for, it's a way we can cope with pain, and it's also a way that we can look at life in its infinite grandeur and mystery and just go, <laughs> I don't know what this cosmic joke is all about, but there is something funny to it. This is wild, right? Um <laughs> Yes, kids laugh 400 times a day and adults about 17 times a day, according to some studies. So as we get older and the bills start to come in and the responsibilities land on our shoulders and all the crap we go through in life and the pain we experience, that's when we stop laughing. I was teaching a course once, a class on, it was just on the phone. It was pre-Zoom. That's how long I've been teaching, pre-Zoom. It was just on the phone. And we were laughing a lot. It was a course on laughing and letting go. And one woman got so angry. She hung up. She emailed and said, I want my money back. All you guys did was laugh the whole time. <laughs> um, and, and she was in too much pain, too much heaviness. She couldn't have or enjoy the playfulness. There was another time when I was running a meditation school in Hawaii. Uh, I had a student call. This, it was a physical center. He called the center. And he goes, I have a, you know, I have a question I need to ask you, David. And for whatever reason, <laughs> I just started laughing. And then he started laughing. And then we had a laughing fit on the phone for a solid five to seven minutes, like crying, laughing. And he goes, honestly, I don't even know why I called. Everything is fine. That was a healing in and of itself. Thank you. And he hung up. <laughs> I wish all my students were that easy. <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh. I haven't done laughing. I have done laughing meditation. Yes. So in laughing meditation, you kind of force yourself to laugh even when you don't mean it until a real laugh starts to come out. And a teacher of mine who passed away, uh, he, he used to say that if you laugh hard enough, right, you start to cry and it's actually you laugh until the pain is able to come up. So the laughter turns into crying and the tears come out. And that's when we've opened up enough for our pain to come out. And I love that. That What is better than that? 
what a, what a, what a beautiful form of healing. And of course, you can use laughter as, as an avoidant technique to never have a real conversation or go deep. But here we're using laughter as a healing antidote to the heaviness and the seriousness of life. Okay. And with that, I've got a couple of jokes. So buckle up. <laughs> Here we go. All right. First one. What do you call an angry carrot? What do you call an angry carrot? A steamed veggie. <laughs> Not very good. I think this next one is going to be better. What do rich people say when they tickle babies? <laughs> Gucci, Gucci, goo. <laughs> I like that one. All right. How many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> I like that. Okay. I've got some more. I'll do one more right now and I'll save a few for later. What do you call an alligator detective? What do you call an alligator who's a detective? An investigator. Oh, that was bad. That was a bad one. <laughs> no, people are saying no. <laughs> you know, when you hear a joke that's so bad, your brain is just like, no. I've had children, I've told jokes to kids, and they're just like, no. <laughs> All right. I think we've started to lighten up a bit. That is good. Maybe lightening up is our first step to enlightenment learning to lighten up and not take everything so seriously. And I get told this all that people will always bring this up to me. They're like, David, how can you laugh? How can, we, how can you be light? How can you enjoy when there's so much wrong with the world? Oh, that always comes up. And it's a super valid point. And my response to that is you can go back any period of time through all of history, go back 10 years, 20, 30, 50, 100, 1,000, there's been pain and suffering since the beginning of time on planet Earth. In fact, maybe this is an easier time for a majority of human beings. Uh, I don't think I'd want to live 500 years ago with the Black Plague, you know, with the life expectancy being 35, right? Or a couple thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago living in a cave. So in a lot of ways, things are better. The world is, is in a precarious place, of course. And so we can, we can hold that and be aware of all the pain and suffering of humanity, but we can also, also have our own internal state and energy and flow with life. We live in a solar system inside of a galaxy, inside of a universe, inside of maybe an me infinite metaverse, infinite, uh, infinite worlds, infinite dimensions. Who the freak knows? And, and pain and suffering is just one facet of this infinite diamond. And we as human beings are going through it and we experience it and it's part of life and growth, but it should not be all consuming. What is the point? If you're on your deathbed and you spent your whole life fighting and resisting suffering and pain, then what was the point of your life? The point of pain uh, is to help us reflect and grow. So there's, there's an equation, pain plus reflection equals growth. Pain without reflection, no growth. Pain without reflection equals suffering. And so when we can use our pain to inform our growth and shift ourselves, that's when we don't have to endlessly suffer. And one way I would like to put it, and I've, I've shared this before, when I was in college, I took a class called uh, Eastern Religions 101, something like that. And it was a huge lecture hall, three or 400 people. Um, and the professor drew this huge line across the board, a uh, horizontal line. And on one side, he wrote suicide. And on the other side of the line, he wrote enlightenment. And then he put a check mark in the middle. And he said, most human beings are in the middle. When we fully don't want to be here anymore, we swing towards suicide, which is, I don't want to, I can't be here. I don't want to be here. I can't handle this pain and suffering anymore. That's the one extreme. 
The other side, enlightenment, is when I fully accept being here without needing to change anything, without judgment, without forcing. I accept the present moment as it is and accept fully being here. That is enlightenment. And we swing as human beings. We kind of are on a pen pendulum of like, I can't stand this place. It's not bad right now. I don't want any more of this. This is pretty good. I mean, and that could change within minutes, hours, days, weeks. We swing and we swing and, you sw and we swing. And that is the human experience. Right? And so when we meditate, which is why we're here together, yes, pain plus reflection equals growth. Yeah. Why we're here is to meditate together and learn how to let go of the resistance of being here. Right? There's a resistance to just being here. It might have started from the moment you were born and you started crying. <laughs> like this is way more painful than being in the warm, comfortable womb. Right. And then as we grow up, we have all of these painful moments. And then we're like, oh, I don't want to be here. I don't want to get up for work. I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to have to make dinner. I don't want to pay those bills. Right. Ugh. And I get heavier and heavier and heavier that I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. I can't deal with this. Those are forms of resistance. And when we learn to meditate well, we learn to be in the moment and let things be as they are without that judgment and resistance. Now, the judgment and resistance might be there still, but perhaps you don't feed it and you allow it to just pass. And that is easier said than done. I can promise you that. Yeah. But... You have to learn how to sit still. And I've taught a lot of classes and retreats in person over the years, and I see my students fidgeting. <laughs> I can't sit still, right? Because when we go to sit still, that is when there is a moment and space for some of that deeper pain to come up to the surface. And if you know someone who can't stop talking, can't stop moving, can't stop doing, can't stop, <laughs> just can't stop, always has to have some drama, just cannot be still, in my experience, it's often because there is underlying pain that they're overriding. And if they slow down, it will come up to the surface. I've even seen people just drive too fast, almost trying to outrun it. Or maybe they run or bicycle, cycle 40 miles a day, just trying to outbike the pain, outrun the pain, because if they slow down, it will rise up to the surface. And that uncomfortability is something they don't want. Now, we are all guilty of this. We just all do it in different ways. So if you're like, I know someone else who does that, David, you do it too. <laughs> maybe more subtly, maybe in a more like palpable you know, palatable, digestible way, right? But you probably still do it too. Someone said, that's my sister. Yeah. And we all know as people that do it and we do it, maybe just not as an extreme way. So how do you override pain? How do you distract yourself from experiencing pain? It could be exercise. It could be television, drugs, alcohol, food, sugar, <laughs> sugar on top of food. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the ways to break through some of these patterns and maybe even addictions, and, and what, by the way, one of the definitions I really like of addiction is the addi addiction, all addictions are the attempt to avoid pain, right? But then ultimately, they lead to more pain. So the avoidance of pain will always ultimately lead to more pain. I mean, pain that's already inside you. Of course, we can avoid external pain. We don't need to step into a, a puddle or, you know, painful situation, but pain that already exists, trying to avoid that when it's ready to come up and heal will always lead to more pain. Right? sit with that for a moment. And before we go further, 
we need a few more jokes. So a, this, a son says to his, his dad, can you please explain to me what a solar eclipse is? And the dad says, no, son. Or no, son. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Why did the man fall down the well? He couldn't see that well. <laughs> That's why we all fall down wells. We don't see it. Where do you take someone who's been in a peekaboo accident? You take them to the ICU. <laughs> oh, that's that's pretty bad. All right, last one. What was even more useful than the first telephone? What was more useful than the first telephone? The second telephone. <laughs> you got to have someone to call. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's right. They're so bad. They're good. <laughs> what are you going to do with one phone? <laughs> okay. Well, let's get to meditating here. And hopefully we've loosened up a bit. And we could loosen up even a bit more as we sit and meditate. So, no avoiding pain today, but also maybe no taking our own story and pain so seriously that we that we kind of freeze it in place. You, have you ever seen The Simpsons? And if you haven't, you better, because it's the best show ever. <laughs> you know when Homer chokes Bart? <laughs> it's like, oh, you... Uh, that's kind of what we do to our pain when we're really serious. We like, we grab it and we squeeze it tighter. Instead of having compassion and giving it space and just like a nice soft attention, we, we, we try to fix it or, or suppress it or hold it tighter, and it actually solidifies the pain more. So if, if you find you do that, in, in today's meditation, let's see if we can have a softer, more compassionate, open approach towards the pain we experience and see what lessons it wants to teach us as we're meditating. Okay. So instead of making pain your enemy, which <laughs> we've all made our pain the enemy of the state, <laughs> old Will Smith movie, um, instead of doing that, let's see if we can relax with our pain and invite it to be present with us and then see what happens. Yeah. All right, let's do that. All right. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.